Welcome to this uh, third session in our module on the Gospels. My name is Derek Tidball and I'm absolutely delighted to be leading you through uh, this module. In our first two sessions we looked at the Gospels more generally. We asked some very basic questions. What is a Gospel? And how did the Synoptic Gospels, in particular Matthew, Mark and Luke, that have so many similarities between them, uh, come to be written? Uh, in that we concluded that the best idea is that Mark was the first Gospel to be written uh, and that Matthew and Luke uh, edited it and added to it uh, to produce their own versions of the life of Jesus. And it's for that reason that throughout the rest of this particular module, we're going to be giving our attention to Mark's Gospel uh, and to introducing it uh, more thoroughly. Uh, we're going to pick up on some of the major themes uh, and uh, today, uh, and then we'll look at uh, some of those particular themes in some depth. But by now you will have read Mark's Gospel, I hope. Uh, I hope you have it in front of you because we'll be referring to it. And I hope you have a notepad there as well. Uh, and if so, take a moment just to uh, jot down one or two impressions of Mark's Gospel. Uh, we don't want full sentences or long notes, uh, just two or three adjectives as to uh, what you picked up that characterises this gospel. Take a moment to do that now. Well, under other circumstances, it would be lovely to be able to share uh, what our impressions were. Uh, but I wonder as we go through this session, uh, whether you can at least compare what you came up with with what I will be saying about my impressions uh, and the impressions of other scholars uh, about this gospel. We begin again just by reminding you about where the gospel came from and perhaps explaining that a little more fully. I'm uh, taking it for granted that it's the earliest gospel if you want to understand why, then look back at the last section, that it is the one on which Matthew and Luke came to build. Uh, but what we didn't say too much in that session was about how Mark came to write the Gospel uh, and where he got his material from. And it's often suggested that the Gospel of Mark consists of the memoirs of Peter, uh, the reason for doing that is one of the earliest historians of the church is a man called Eusebius. He wrote the history of the church. I have a recent copy of it here. Uh, and in this book, which he wrote around 300 or so, on a couple of occasions he refers to Mark's Gospel and where it came from. He quotes in it uh, Bishop Papias who a century before, uh, before Eusebius himself was writing, commented that Mark was requested by others, pressured by others, to put down into writing the sermons and the sayings and the stories told by the Apostle Peter. Uh, so many in the early church thought those sayings were wonderful but wanted uh, a more permanent record of them. And so it was the oral story of Jesus as told by Peter that came, it's often thought, into written form in terms of Mark's gospel. And it shows some of the hallmarks of having been an oral gospel, first of all. So to quote Eusebius himself, he says Mark who had been Peter's interpreter, wrote down carefully, but not in order, all that he remembered of the Lord's sayings and doings. That characterises Mark's Gospel well. We can't be totally sure who Mark was, but we assume him to be uh, 
the mark referred to by Peter himself in 1 Peter 5.13. Uh, they clearly did have a close companionable relationship. Uh, he comes up, uh, if it's the same one, in the Acts of the Apostles a number of times. You probably remember uh, causing Paul, first of all, some questions as to his stamina for the mission of Christ. But obviously from Paul's later writings, again becoming a good supporter of Paul's mission and a close friend. He may even just make a cameo appearance in Mark's Gospel himself, the, the young man who flees naked from the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, but we can't be sure. Uh, the fact that he doesn't introduce himself and in fact that his name is not attached to the gospel suggests that it was probably widely understood in the early church who he was. It's not only that external evidence that uh, supports Mark as the writer of this gospel, but some of the internal evidence supports it as well. There are several stories which suggest first-hand testimony. You can hear Peter recalling the event in his mind's eye as he retells the story of Jesus uh, and Mark furiously capturing it and writing it down. It has the sort of eyewitness detail about it that you might not expect if it's just a theoretical work or a work at a distance. The role Peter himself plays in the gospel is an interesting one. It's very honest about him, uh, about his leadership, but also about his failures. And there's just that very interesting, wonderful little note right at the end, when in the brief account of the resurrection, uh, the women are told to go back to the disciples and tell them to meet Jesus in Galilee. And what does the text actually say in verse 7 of chapter 16 it says go tell his disciples and Peter the apostle who had failed Jesus and denied him is given special mention as the one who is going to be restored now uh, in the resurrection period so the internal evidence supports the external testimony that this was well, the nearest thing we get to Jesus himself, in that they are the words of his closest disciple, his primary apostle, being recorded vividly by John Mark. Uh, we won't go in great detail into the purpose or date of the gospel. That will emerge as we talk about some of the themes. It's often suggested it was written for the Christians in Rome uh, who were suffering for their faith with a view to encourage them to having a more robust faith. That makes a great deal of sense uh, for a variety of reasons which will emerge. But we can't be over specific or over confident uh, about such things and certainly whatever the first readership of the gospel it wasn't limited to them uh, and to them alone as to its date well because of a variety of references within it uh, especially perhaps chapter 13 and its uh, look at what was about to take place in jerusalem in the jewish wars uh, it's probable that uh, it was written in the years 65 to 70 AD, although other people suggest other times. So an early gospel with a purpose of encouraging discipleship and introducing Jesus. What I want to do in this next section is to look at a whole variety of issues that reflect Mark's distinctive style. It is very much the popular newspaper type style uh, of gospel that he is writing rather than the uh, more reflective theological uh, serious newspaper like the Times or the Guardian. Uh, we'll uh, explain why that's so as we unfold these issues.
to begin with, he just jumps straight in. Uh, Matthew and Luke tell us about the ancestry of Jesus, the family background. Uh, they start with the stories about his birth. Mark isn't concerned with any of that. His opening salvos are about the ministry of Jesus, the baptism of the temptation. He's very anxious to get on with it uh, and tell you the story. Uh, not only does he jump straight in, but once he gets going, it's a short gospel, which is full of action and uh, is an action packed gospel. As Morna Hooker, one of the great scholars about Mark's gospel said, it, it's an extremely dynamic portrait of Jesus. It's uh, also said that uh, uh, he writes in a staccato, quick fire type of way. It, it pours out of him. So you get uh, four major reports of exorcisms, uh, but a number of other brief reports about exorcisms that were going on. You get a list of uh, miracles that Matthew and Luke pick up on, and a sense of conflict with the Jewish authorities right from the start. It's breathtaking, even in the way in which it's organized. You remember that little phrase that Eusebius used, that he was the interpreter of Peter and wrote things down carefully, but not in order. He is a little more difficult to uh, analyze than uh, the more organized Matthew and Luke is. It doesn't mean to say he's chaotic, as we'll see, uh, but there is a sense of uh, one thing tumbling out after another. The very language he uses adds to that impression of a gospel being written in top gear. So he uses the word immediately, uh, in the Greek the word euthus, 41 times, which when that occurs in 16 chapters is quite some going. Uh, and when you add other similar expressions like uh, as soon as, you get this sense of rapid pace. Uh, doesn't come over in the English as much as it does in the original Greek. But one of uh, Mark's stylistic features is to use what's called the historic present. If you've ever tried to write any history or report at all on the past, it can seem very remote and very leaden if you just write always in the past tense. He said, he went, he did. And so one of the things we often tend to do is to uh, update that. It wasn't that Winston Churchill said this during the Second World War, but Winston Churchill says uh, and that gives it a more present feel. That, uh, according to those who've counted it, occurs 151 times in Mark's Gospel. Uh, but the difficulty with using the historic present, uh, as I know from my own experience, is that you tend to mix your tenses in an untidy way if you're not careful. And so our English translations have tidied it up and we've lost that sense to a great extent of the historic present that Mark originally used. We already commented on the way in which there's an eyewitness feel uh, to much of Mark's writing. Little details that crop up by somebody who was probably present when the action took place. So if you were to look, for example, at the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6, verse 30 onwards, well, much of it is uh, a report that anyone could give. Uh, but then he slips in things like, um, uh, they, verse 39, then Jesus commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave it to his disciples. 
to set before the people. That's pretty much an eyewitness account and there are many other places where you think actually Mark wrote this on the basis of somebody who was present and witnessed this happening. Uh, there's also a, a real sense of honesty or candor, uh, for example, about Peter, but about the disciples and their failures generally. Uh, perhaps the sort of candor that could only come from the person that is being written about. If somebody else said some of these things, it might appear to be very rude or undermining. But for the person themselves to admit their failures is a different issue. So classically, you've got that wonderful confession of Peter that occurs in chapter 8 and verse 33 at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And uh, he responds rightly on behalf of the others. Uh, that you are the Christ, uh, the uh, one who is to be the Messiah of Israel. Uh, and Jesus tells them to not tell others about it and begins to build on that by explaining that as the Christ, uh, he's going to suffer and die. That was totally unexpected to them. They thought the Christ would be a strong military figure who would kick out the Romans and triumph in military warfare. So it wasn't surprising that Peter reacted to Jesus saying uh, by rebuking him and telling him, no, no, uh, that's not going to happen, Jesus. And then you get in verse 33 of chapter 8, Jesus saying to Peter, get behind me, Satan. For well, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Ouch. Uh, what a, a, a tragic moment when having reached the high point of saying he is the Christ. Jesus now turns around and says to Peter, you're Satan. I guess if Jesus said that to you, you'd remember it, wouldn't you? But it takes some courage to admit that that's going on and that's the sort of raw honesty that comes up again and again in the gospel yet another feature is uh, called a sandwich construction it perhaps contributes a little bit to this sense of rush that we've spoken of that you find in Mark's Gospel. Uh, is it six times, I think, uh, Mark deviates to this sandwich construction? That is to say, he tells a story within a story. So he starts off telling one story, deviates to another, and then comes back to the first story. Uh, you've got it there in chapter 5, classically, verse 21 onwards. Jesus is there in public in the crowd and the ruler of the synagogue Jairus comes to see him because his daughter is ill and, and he wants Jesus to come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Now so no sooner has that request been made than Jesus feels that there's somebody in the crowd who's touched his garment not just jostling him in the crowd but in a special way and so we get the story of the healing of the woman who for years has been suffering from an internal hemorrhage and has not been able to find a cure and only after he's healed her and given her the assurance that she's a, a daughter of God whose faith has made her well do we pick up again on the story of Jairus's daughter and Jesus goes uh, to Jairus's house, uh, by which time she's already dead, but he brings her back to life again. 
and six times that story within a story type approach occurs. Uh, you've got it in chapter three, uh, verses 20 to 25. Jesus family come to see him. Actually, they want to take him out of the public sphere. They're embarrassed by what he's claiming and what he's doing and what he's saying. He's bringing, as far as they're concerned, shame on the family. So they want to take him home and uh, sort him out in private. But no sooner do they appear on the scene and the, their intention is announced than the scribes come down from Jerusalem and, and a discussion takes place between Jesus and the scribes. Uh, and they have uh, an argument and the conflict begins to arise, uh, take a further step forward between them. And only after they've been sorted out and it's been made clear that Jesus is not doing this, uh, working these miracles by the power of the demons or by the power of Satan, the chief of the demons, Beelzebub. Uh, but actually, he's doing it by the power of God. Only then do, do the families come back on the scene and does he wrap up that particular story. It's almost as if Mark was in a rush, starting to tell one story and then letting another interrupt it and coming back to it. That's quite a human thing to do, isn't it? Uh, yet another little thing to note about Mark's gospel uh, is this sense of threefold repetition that occurs within it. We may say that he's not particularly highly organized, uh, and yet uh, there is the use of this threefold repetition that occurs on a number of occasions. Uh, the most obvious one, the outstanding example, is that Jesus predicts his own death three times. We've already mentioned one of them in chapter 8, uh, around verse 30, where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and is immediately told about the way in which that messiahship is to come into effect by his death. But that same prediction of his death occurs in the next chapter, in chapter 9, verses 30 to 31. And again in the next chapter, chapter 10, verses 32 to 34. It's unmissable. This is not just a one-off, but a clear threefold repetition of an important point. Uh, there are three stories uh, uh, about boat scenes. Not every threefold repetition seems to have quite such importance. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times the disciples are told to keep alert, to keep awake as Jesus goes off to pray. So there's this sense of emphasising things by repeating them. Leads me to say, next time you criticise a preacher for his three points or her three points, uh, maybe there's some good biblical precedent for it in Mark. And actually we know more widely from the point of view of speaking, public speaking, that that sense of threefoldness is a helpful rhetorical advice. You see, it's about the way we speak, and that's reflected in Mark's Gospel. Uh, one of the other features, just to note as you read through it, is that Mark doesn't make great assumptions about people understanding the Jewish background. So, uh, Though he quotes on a number of occasions Aramaic phrases, the original language Jesus would have spoken, uh, and though he quotes uh, Hebrew customs, he goes out of his way to explain them. So in chapter 5 and verse 41, uh, that healing of uh, Jairus's daughter, uh, 
we read that uh, taking her by the hand, Jesus said to her, Talitha Cumai. And then Mark says, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And that's not the only example. It seems that he does have a Gentile audience in mind, and he needs to explain some things that a, somebody with a Jewish background would have readily understood. And so there's a translation of some Aramaic words and of Hebrew customs from time to time. So you get the sense of this uh, wonderfully active, alive, assertive gospel, which majors on what Jesus did in his conflict with the Jewish authorities and indeed the kingdom of Satan. But that's given rise to uh, a distortion, I think, that I want to correct with you for a time. It's often said that Mark's Gospel is full of activity and that therefore it doesn't have so much teaching in it as some of the other Gospels. But let's look at what it actually says about Jesus as a teacher for uh, some moments. Uh, teaching in Mark uh, actually covers quite a bit of the Gospel. To begin with, Jesus announces his own purpose as having come to teach, not just to heal uh, and to commit exorcisms. But we read uh, typically in chapter 6 and verse 6 that Jesus went about among the villages teaching. Or in chapter 10 and verse 1, a summary statement, as was his custom, he taught them. So it wasn't only that he healed them or exercised them, he certainly did, but that he also taught them the values of the kingdom of God and revealed the truth of God to them. There are in fact 16 references to his teaching in Mark's Gospel, which is quite a lot in 16 chapters. And when you calculate the amount of space given to his teaching, well, it comes to a third of the gospel. And since we often think that a third of the gospel is taken up with the passion and crucifixion of Jesus, uh, only a third is left for the actions, the activity and the travel of Jesus, as it were. It's quite a significant proportion of Mark's gospel. Twelve times Mark actually calls Jesus teacher a term of respect, but also a term that focuses in on what Jesus is called to do. It may not be as well organised, certainly, as Matthew, but there are whole passages, whole chunks, chapters as we know them, which concern the teaching of Jesus. The first one occurs in Mark chapter 1, where he begins by telling some of the parables of the kingdom. The first one is the parable of the sower, and that's followed by uh, uh, the parables of the growing seed and of the mustard seed. Quite a bit of the teaching of the kingdom, which you'll find in Matthew chapter 13, but is introduced early in Mark's Gospel. In chapter 7, the key theme is the theme of purity. And the way in which the Jews were terribly concerned about external purity, the washing of uh, pots and pans, keeping their hands clean, ritual washing. But Jesus is concerned to point out that actually pollution comes from the inside and it's internal cleansing that we need rather than to be so obsessed by this external rule. In chapter 9 onwards, we get uh, further teaching into chapter 10 about discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Well, it means to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. It means to take the humble place 
it means to deal with temptation to sin and a whole range of other things. In chapter 12, again, there's a whole variety of teaching, some of it in the form of parables. It's here that Mark records the parable of the tenants, the uh, lodgers who don't want the owner's son to come and collect the harvest from the vineyard that year. And so they increasingly uh, up the ante, they expel the early messengers until eventually they expel the son from his rightful property. Uh, a parable perhaps about how the Jews are going to react to Jesus. And so it goes on teaching about paying taxes to Caesar and the greatest commandments and the value of giving, which is not measured by the size of the gift, but by the motive, as he draws attention to the widow's offering. And then into chapter 13, which is often known as uh, Mark's Apocalypse, or the Little Apocalypse, where Jesus reflects in answering a question from the disciples on the future. Now that's a chapter that's been interpreted in a number of different ways. Some people traditionally have argued that that's all about the second coming of Jesus. This is all yet to happen at the end of time. More recently, some scholars have said, no, no, it resonates too much with what was about to take place in uh, Jerusalem in the Jewish wars of the years 68 to 70. And uh, so they've said it's not about the, the future second coming, even though other parts of the New Testament teach that, but is about the more immediate future. Many scholars will accept that it's actually uh, answering two questions and speaking about two different times. This is the most satisfactory explanation from my viewpoint. First of all, when the disciples pick up on the beauty of the temple and <clears throat> ask about its permanence, Jesus does begin by answering uh, about the immediate future and the way in which within a couple of decades from when he is speaking this wonderful temple will be smashed to pieces and the jews will bring the the, the romans will bring the jewish nation to an end a and the features of the early part of this chapter clearly resonate with what happened in the year 68 69 70 Jesus says about that time, be alert to the signs of the time. You'll know when this is going to happen. But then in the second part of the chapter, he seems to change gear and talk about a, a more distant future when the Son of Man will come, when other signs will come into play, which are apocalyptic signs. And about that period, Jesus says, Nobody knows when that's going to take place, not even the Son of Man. So there are whole chunks, chapters of teaching in Mark's Gospel. One of the other lovely things about the Gospel is the way in which the people react to Jesus' teaching. When they listen to him, they're aware of a huge difference between what they were used to by the coming from the scribes and the Pharisees and what they heard from the lips of Jesus. The rabbis of the day, the teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees were used to arguing over documents and, uh, and interpreting uh, minute details like contemporary lawyers do. Uh, but here was a man who actually spoke firsthand, who had more immediate knowledge who spoke uh, with authority and with excitement. And so typically in chapter 1, verse 27, 
we read that the people's reaction was to say to each other, what is this? A new teaching, revolutionary teaching, and with authority. It was revolutionary because uh, what Jesus taught challenged so much of the perceived wisdom, received wisdom of the time and stood some of the values of the world on its head, taught that God was going to rescue the world in, in a way which was very different from the way people expected him to do so. More of that when we come to look at the kingdom of God later. But no wonder he was teaching that they couldn't just, uh, well, yawn about and uh, regard as insignificant the teaching that made them sit up and take notice. So why do people say Mark isn't a teaching gospel? Well, there are some obvious differences, aren't there? For example, there is no record of the Sermon on the Mount, or uh, as Luke puts it, the Sermon on the Plain, that you get in the other synoptic gospels. So the appearance, if you're not careful, is that there isn't so much teaching. But there is in fact a huge amount of teaching in Mark's Gospel. Let's turn to a number of wider issues just to put them on the agenda rather than deal with them in any way at this time. Uh, there are three issues at least that we'll encounter as we unfold the teaching of Mark's Gospel. It's often said that it's a passion narrative with a long introduction. And indeed, a huge proportion of the gospel is given over to dealing with the passion and crucifixion of Jesus. Why is that? What's the significance of it? Well, we'll come to look at that later. One of the other things that crops up uh, that's drawn a great deal of a, a, attention by the scholars is what's called the secrecy motif. It occurs in a number of ways. Uh, when Jesus tells the parables, uh, it's not always clear that people understood them. Even the disciples didn't. Uh, and Jesus speaks to his disciples when he's telling that first parable about the, the parable of the sower, uh, about the way in which uh, those parables hide a secret, as it were. He talks about it as the mystery of the kingdom that needs to be revealed. And time and again, when he conducts a miracle, he tells the person who's been healed not to go and tell anyone else as if. So folks have built up this uh, idea that there's a theme running through of Jesus wanting uh, to behave in a secret way. Why should that be so? Well, some will give a sceptical answer to that. It's because Jesus isn't entirely sure who he is. The more obvious explanation is that Jesus is functioning in such a counter-cultural way such an upside down way that if the news of who he was gets out too quickly, his hand would be forced to reject the alternative way of God and to behave in the way that everyone expected the Messiah or the Christ to behave. It's in Luke's Gospel rather than Mark. But when Jesus goes to his home synagogue in Nazareth and reads from the scroll of Isaiah uh, and tells people that this was being fulfilled before their very eyes. The crowd want to seize him and make him king immediately. They want to force his hand so that um, he can uh, bring in the kingdom by military might and uh, literally expel the Romans by force of arms. That's one of the great themes of Jesus Christ Superstar, the, the musical, if you know it. But Jesus knows that's not God's way of working. And therefore, rather than prematurely being revealed, 
as the Christ. He is creating the space and opportunity to rescue the world in the way in which God himself has planned. Then there's the puzzle about Mark's gospel as to which ending is the genuine authentic ending. Uh, when you give a police statement, uh, you're asked to sign that statement right at the very bottom of what you've written without a gap in order that nothing else can be added in subsequently and people can know that that's what you've said and that's where you've finished. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to Mark's gospel, we, we don't have his signature at the end like that on the next line. Uh, and so uh, uh, we're left with something of a puzzle. The earliest manuscripts finish Mark's gospel at chapter 16 and verse 8. Uh, but when you read that, it doesn't seem the most satisfactory ending. If you really did end there, Mark, why? What were you playing at? You see, it ends with a very brief report of the resurrection. Uh, but then uh, it says that the women from the tomb went out and fled from the tomb uh, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And you just left dangling. Is that what you intended, Mark? Well, there are all sorts of stories told about that, aren't there? Uh, perhaps the end of Mark's Gospel, as he wrote it, got ripped off, and they didn't have cello tape to hand to. Uh, paste it back on. Uh, perhaps he was interrupted. Perhaps he too was cut off at that point by the authorities. Who knows? Um, some people say, no, no, uh, it's genuine. Because after all, um, it adds a note of authenticity, doesn't it? People don't rise from the dead every day. These women had not encountered a arisen person before that they knew for sure had been executed a few days earlier. Uh, and so it reflects their true emotional turmoil. But very early on, uh, whoever decided that it wasn't the best ending to Mark's gospel, and so they they tried to amend it a bit. Uh, and, and so perhaps uh, an extra couple of verses 9 to 11 were added. But they didn't help much uh, because, uh, uh, yes, Mary Magdalene went out and told those who'd been with him uh, as they mourned and wept that they had seen Jesus. But when the disciples heard it, uh, they wouldn't believe it. They probably, in the context of the day, dismissed the women's testimony as overwrought, silly, emotional women. Uh, but does that improve things any more? Well, only a little. It's two steps forward and one step back. So maybe somebody else added verse, uh, verses 12 and 13, where you get a report of uh, he appeared in another form to two of them. This could be the two that Luke speaks about on the Emmaus Road. So they went back, presumably, to Jerusalem and told the rest. But still the disciples didn't believe. So somebody finally added verses uh, uh, 14 through to 20, which gives a much more satisfactory uh, ending and uh, a consistent ending. Uh, it includes the Great Commission that otherwise would be absent. Uh, and it gives this powerful, dynamic sense of the mission of the church from then on. When they preach this gospel, they will be accompanied by signs. They'll be able to cast out demons, just as Jesus had done, speak in new tongues, just as the apostles did in the Acts of the Apostles. They'll pick up serpents with their hands, uh, 
uh, as Paul did on his final journey to Jerusalem. Uh, and they will drink deadly poison, but it won't hurt them. All those things are echoed by the gospel of the wider New Testament. Uh, and they fit very much consistently with the portrait of the ongoing mission of Jesus. Incidentally, we should say there's no encouragement here to test God out. <laughs> it's not suggesting that you should go out and deliberately find snakes and pick them up and see if they bite you and claim deliverance, uh, as some have done. Uh, there was a great cult in the States at one stage of so-called Christian snake handlers that eventually died when the last leader picked up a snake and it killed him. It's simply saying we live in this dangerous world and if we encounter such danger God is able to take us through and give us deliverance. Now it's impossible to say which of those is the genuine authentic ending. It's quite permissible because the manuscripts containing them all can be fairly early if, if even if they're different manuscripts. Quite possible to believe and read and preach on them all as an authentic part of the gospel. We turn now to the question of an outline of Mark's gospel. Uh, we've already said that it's uh, not perhaps as well organised as Matthew or Luke, uh, but there is a sense of organisation about it. And uh, Dick France, one of the great commentators on Mark's gospel, speaks of it as uh, uh, a gospel in three acts, and this is perhaps the most helpful way of looking at it. Uh, others make the outline much more complicated because of this slight sense of things pouring out of Mark. But when we stand back, we can indeed see these three acts. After the introduction, verses 1 to 13 of chapter 1, the first act takes place in Galilee. It occurs when Jesus begins to preach, uh, chapter 1 and verse 14, uh, and goes through a number of healings and miracles and exorcisms and teaching through to chapter 8 and verse 21. The second act, uh, containing uh, different but similar material, all concerns the journey from Galilee uh, to Jerusalem. That's the act that contains the journey up to Caesarea of Philippi and, and the confession of Peter up in the north and then the long way down by foot to the capital city of Jerusalem. The third act, chapter 11, 1 through to the end, whichever ending you choose, all occur in Jerusalem. To begin with, you get stories of the teaching of Jesus spending those last days in Jerusalem. Before in chapter 14, verse 1, we begin to uh, get very close into the action. Starting with the Passover, we get quickly to the betrayal and the passion of Jesus. Before in chapter 15, we read the record, the report of his crucifixion and burial. And then in chapter 16, uh, not an elaborate telling of many stories, but a very firm announcement of the resurrection, plus the additional endings of which we've just spoken. So you get this dynamic sense of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. Traditionally many Christians in wanting to introduce people to Jesus have used John's Gospel. I confess personally I've never quite understood why that should be so. Uh, I've tended to use Mark's Gospel because it's a more immediate introduction to the person 
of Christ and, and it lacks some of those long conversations you get in John which are brilliant for those of a more theological or philosophic disposition. But Mark introduces you to the person of Jesus. And that's going to be the subject of our next session. Let me just uh, introduce that by reminding you that the symbol for Mark's gospel traditionally has been the sense of the lion. You will have picked up a little as we've gone through of the, the lion on the prowl, the lion roaring, the lion facing opposition but conquering. And as one New Testament scholar has put it, this leads you to a picture that the Jesus of Mark is overpowering, that he really is a strong character who conquers. Robert Gundry, who said that, also makes the point that this isn't just history, this isn't just a proclamation of fact. There are implications for us in this portrait of Jesus. If he is this overpowering, strong Christ, then let the weak find in him their champion. He'll take our side, fight our battles and give us victories. But let those of us who are self-sufficient and strong actually bow the knee and recognize that the, for the strong, this Jesus is their conqueror whom they need to follow and obey. So Mark gives us this wonderful portrait of Jesus. And in the next couple of sessions, we'll begin to unpack that even more.